Okay, gang, we're going to be talking about Earth's energy exchange. So, in the last lecture, we learned about the uh, Earth Sun interactions, how Earth's tilt gets to seasons, but it was really just the fact that Earth is this ball that's spinning around the Sun and it has a tilt as it goes around and it gets differentially heated. There's more heat hitting the equator than it's hitting the poles. Now, we're going to dive into our planet itself and look what happens to that energy from the sun when it interacts with our atmosphere and the surface of the earth. Okay, so last time I told you that more energy hits the equator than anywhere else and here's the equator right here but if you look at this diagram what it's telling you is the actual amount of energy that hits the surface of the earth that actually is higher at the mid latitudes tropic of cancer tropic of capricorn here's the tropic of capricorn here's the tropic of cancer that's where most of the energy is hitting it's not really at the equator so it seems like i lied to you but i didn't i didn't lie to you and the reason I didn't lie to you is something happens to that energy when it's coming in from the sun at the equator that it doesn't make it to the surface. Something happens to it in the atmosphere. Can you think what happens to it? You kind of feel like you're on Dora the Explorer? That only is going to make sense if you watch that show and have kids. But what happens to it is so much heat hits at the equator that it gets so hot that you get a lot of storms that develop. Heat will cause air to rise and you'll get a lot of storms. So it rains a lot in the equator and to generate rain you need clouds and clouds are white which will reflect a lot of incoming energy and that will keep the equator from receiving a lot of incoming energy. At the mid latitudes where you happen to live here in Phoenix we have hardly any clouds. So even though the sun isn't as high in the sky where we live, we get a lot of incoming solar energy because we have very few cloudy days and we get a lot of uh, energy from the sun. And the winter is the Sahara and Arabian Desert. They're the ones that get the most. And I'm fine with that. We get enough sun here in Phoenix. Okay, hope that made sense. So here's the, uh, oh, I probably, sorry, let me scratch my ear, sorry. Uh, here are the four things that happen to sunlight once it interacts with our atmosphere. That energy can get scattered. We're going to learn about two types of scattering, Rayleigh scattering and me scattering. Not you scattering, it's a dumb joke. Uh, light can get refracted, it can get reflected, and it can get absorbed. Down here at the bottom I have a link. Uh, that link is also provided for you on Canvas. Go ahead and check that out. That will help you understand uh, Rayleigh scattering. Okay, so hopefully you have a better sense for how Rayleigh scattering works. Rayleigh scattering generates our blue sky. What happens is, is when the shortwave energy that we can see comes in from the sun to our planet, as that energy is going in, the red, the green, the blues, the yellows, just go through the atmosphere no problem at all for the most part but blue uh, happens to be at the right wavelength that'll start impacting molecules in the atmosphere and when it impacts those molecules it scatters it gets shot all over the atmosphere like pinballs and that will generate the blue sky wherever you look uh, my students usually think the sky is blue because it reflects off the ocean light reflects off the ocean and that's not the case at all it's blue light hits air molecules and gets scattered all over the atmosphere. Now when the sun gets lower in the sky and that light has to go through more atmosphere before it gets to your eyes, at that point you're not scattering blue as much, you start to scatter the other colors, reds and purples and yellows and stuff. Another type of scattering is me scattering and this is something that we tend to get a lot in the winter time and if you ever drive to Tucson you get this all the time is you're if you're looking towards the sun you'll tend to see a white glare in the sky so instead of it being blue it's white you're getting this white glare 
What happens in me scattering is that light comes in and it impacts sand particles and other pollen particles in the atmosphere and the light gets concentrated towards you. So it gets concentrated in a forward direction. So it gets really bright. If you look away from the sun, if you look, if you were looking at the sun and you look behind you, the sky is blue. It's normal. You don't get any of this me scattering. So it scatters in a forward direction. What's neat though, because the light is white, that means it happens to all colors in the spectrum. It's not just blue, it happens to all the colors. Uh, like in the crayon world, if you mix all the colors, you get this brown. In the light world, if you mix all the colors, you get white. So all the colors are getting scattered in me scattering. So in Rayleigh scattering, it's only the blue light and it gets scattered everywhere. In me scattering, it's all the colors of the spectrum, so that's why it's white, but it only gets scattered in a forward direction. It doesn't get scattered everywhere, just in a forward direction. All right, refracted sunlight. Refracted sunlight um, is neat. You might have uh, tried to entertain your friends when you put a straw into a glass of water and you look at it, you can see that it looks kind of bent or fat. If you've never done this, you need to do it. It will blow your mind. And what happens is, is when light goes through denser objects, uh, the light will slow down and change direction a little bit. So uh, let's, talk, let's look at this uh, sun one, for example. So when the light is traveling from space, which has no density, and hits our atmosphere, which is much denser, It'll slow down and change direction. And what can happen is the sun will have already set. But because the light from the sun hits our atmosphere, slows down and changes direction, the observer, you, could still see it. And so the sun can appear to sit on the horizon. It's already set, but it looks, but you can still see it because of that refraction uh, process, which is kind of neat. So sunlight can get refracted. You also get beautiful rainbows like this. I got to take this picture once on a backpacking trip. It was awesome. Got to see both ends of the rainbow. There was no gold, but it was rather beautiful. Uh, what happens in rainbows is the sunlight comes in, and to see a rainbow, the sun will always be behind you, and the sunlight will hit raindrops. And when it hits those raindrops, it slows down. The light will slow down and change direction because a raindrop is more dense in the atmosphere. But what's neat, because the raindrop is curved, when the spectrum of light slows down and changes directions, they do it unequally, meaning the red will slow down and change direction the least, and blue will slow down and change direction the most. And so basically the colors of light get spread out so you can see them. That light then is still headed away from you, but then it'll hit raindrops in the sky and it will reflect off those raindrops. It bounces off those raindrops reflection back into your eyes so you can see the rainbow, which is awesome. You also look closely, you can see uh, there's a double rainbow here, so it gets refracted twice before it goes into your eyes. And you can see the colors actually are reverse. Here it's red on the outside, here it's red on the inside. So, kind of cool. Okay, reflection. Reflection is easy. Light comes in and it bounces off the surface. And the key term you need to understand here is albedo. So the whiter the object, it's white because it's reflecting most of the incoming energy. So fresh snow has 80 to 95% reflectivity, or it has a, an albedo that reflects 80 to 95% of that incoming energy. Whereas asphalt is black because it absorbs most. It only reflects 5 to 10%. Um, and then in the colors that you might see, like if you're seeing a blue house, it's absorbing most of the colors, but it's going to be reflecting a lot of blue. That's why you see it as blue. Last thing is, energy can get absorbed. Uh, here's a picture of Badwater Death Valley. It's the lowest spot in North America. It's also recorded a temperature of 134 degrees in the 1930s. That's hot. Lucho solar energy absorption. Okay, so we need to talk about once energy gets absorbed, what can happen to it? And these are the four things. Once energy has been absorbed, that energy can get radiated, it can get conducted, 
the energy can convect or it can generate uh, latent heat. These processes are also known as the heat and energy transfer processes. So let's take a look at this pot. Once energy has been absorbed into this pot, heat can get radiated. So if you put your hand over a pot of boiling water, you'll feel the heat coming off. That's the radiated heat. It can also get conducted. Conducted is the molecule-molecule transfer of energy. So if you put your hand on the handle, you'll feel those molecules that are getting really hot closer to the pot on that handle. You'll feel it in your hand. Uh, energy can be convected. Convected is this water. The water down here at the bottom gets hotter than the water at the top. So the water that's hotter will rise because it ends up becoming less dense. It's hotter. It's moving faster and the cold water at the top moves down. And that convective process distributes heat throughout the whole volume of water. So it's, you're transferring the heat through circulation. And the last one is latent heat. I don't really want you worried about latent heat right now, but basically what happens in latent heat is when the water evaporates, it goes from water into water vapor, it absorbs heat in that process, taking it away. Cool heat energy transfer processes. Okay, so let's look at it on the surface of the planet. Here comes shortwave energy from the sun. It can, uh, what's our first one? It can scatter, generating our blue sky, or give you a white glare and me scattering. It can reflect off clouds because they're white. Uh, it can um, refract as it goes through a cloud, goes through denser objects, bending it a little bit. Um, once it gets absorbed, it can emit it back up into space. That's what's known as long wave energy. You can't see long wave energy. Um, and then let's also talk about, it can also get radiated, but it can also get uh, conducted deeper into the surface. So the surface can conduct heat down below. It can also uh, cause water to evaporate and that's known as latent heat and if this was water you can also cause that water to convect so that's kind of what's happening in our atmosphere okay let's take a look at the greenhouse effect you guys have likely heard of the greenhouse effect take a minute and think about this question what effect will clouds have on the surface temperature at night and the day. What effect do clouds have on the surface temperature at night and the day? And you can look at that diagram to kind of think about it. So if you thought to yourself, during the day, clouds keep things cool. Right? When it's cloudy out, it's cooler during the day, and that's because energy is getting reflected off the white clouds, keeping the surface temperatures cool. But what's neat is at night, clouds act like a blanket. So this long wave energy that's coming off the surface, you can't see long wave energy. It's heat. But clouds are very good at absorbing that long wave energy that's coming off the surface. The clouds will absorb that energy and emit it back down onto the surface. It acts like a blanket and it keeps the surface hotter. So clouds basically keep temperatures more moderate. You don't get as hot during the day and you don't get as cold at night. And that's kind of how global warming works. Uh, global warming is instead of having uh, clouds, and clouds are good, you know, water vapor, water droplets, are greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases are, they don't have that first process though. So clouds during the day can keep you cooler because it reflects that incoming light. But uh, greenhouse gases don't do that. They'll allow energy to come in from the sun uh, and doesn't reflect any it out. So you get just as hot during the day with greenhouse gases. But greenhouse gases will act like a cloud. In the long wave where you can't see, those greenhouse gases will absorb that energy and then emit it back down on the surface. So the, the more greenhouse gases we have in the atmosphere, the more of a blanket we have over the atmosphere. 
And having a blanket over the atmosphere is great. If we didn't have any greenhouse gases, our planet would have an average temperature of like negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit or something. So we, we definitely want that blanket of greenhouse gases. Uh, the trick is we're getting more greenhouse gases and that's causing the surface temperature to uh, warm up. So as surface temperatures on our planet warm up, um, we're losing our polar ice where you're actually, for the first time, you can travel the Northwest Passage on our planet. That never happened before. Uh, the oceans are starting to rise. They're rising because you're melting, you're melting ice at the poles, but also because the oceans are warming up. And that means the water is expanding. As temperatures change on the planet, you have species that are in areas where it's sensitive to temperature change. This is a frog that's now extinct. They used to live high on a tropical mountain, but as that basically the mountain warmed up, they, since they were at the top, they needed it cooler. They're now extinct. Uh, polar bears are going extinct. Well, they're may kind of going extinct, but they're also they're actually starting to mate with grizzlies, so they're possibly adapting as well. Um, in some areas, you're getting more rain. In other areas, you're getting droughts. Uh, basically, the planet's changing, and um, it's uh, honestly not very good it, it, as the as the sea levels rise sometimes there's something like 90 percent of all airports in the world are at roughly within 10 feet of the ocean because that's cheap land to build a giant airport but as oceans rise those airports are going to have to move that's an incredibly expensive process all shipping ports are situated at current sea level as that rises you're gonna to have to adjust that so we're looking at trillions of dollars of infrastructure that'll have to be adjusted as it rises um, positives from global warming you're gonna to start to be able to grow crops in other places that you haven't Canada's looking pretty good for uh, growing crops uh, northern Russia Siberia is gonna get more habitable but then it gets tough because China used to control Siberia and it it might want that land, and if it does, you could have a war between Russia and China. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it could. And both those countries have nuclear weapons. So anyway, we're in flux. Uh, for most of humanity's history, temperatures have been roughly the same. We, there are exceptions. We have had little ice ages and things. But now they're starting to warm up, and we're going to have to deal with this change. All right, here's your thing snow list, general distribution of insulation on the planet, Rayleigh scattering, me scattering, rainbows, um, what is albedo, the four ways energy is absorbed, and the greenhouse effect and global warming. I help in the textbook. We don't actually have a textbook, so ignore this, ignore this help down here at the bottom. Um, apologize that that's there. Hope you've enjoyed it. Have a great rest of your day, and thanks for listening. Bye.